Stephen? Show it here. Okay. Oh. So welcome. Welcome. Um, I'm Richard Freeman, <laughs> and this is... I'm Mary Taylor. And uh, we, like everybody else in the world at the moment, are going a little batty due to the coronavirus and being um, having our routine upset, having our uh, samskaras challenged, and having our habits uh, sort of thrown up in our faces. And yeah. so we, one of the things we started thinking that would be um, possibly and hopefully helpful for the community of yoga people we know all around the world is to um, start doing some studio talks. And that's what we've decided to call them, um, which that we plan to do regularly scheduled, at least for the next three weeks, regularly scheduled uh, talks on Wednesday evenings, um, timing it so that there will be one talk the Wednesday evening after the United States presidential election. Um, we decided to do that in part because after the 2016 presidential election. Yeah, we went to the Mind and Life Institute conference um, and there were about a thousand or? Yeah. Closer well, to 2,000. Closer to 2,000 uh, neuroscientists who were into meditation and uh, sharing with them uh, was actually very nourishing. Yeah. They were in shock just as we were. And, uh, and so we, we figured whatever happens on November 3rd of this year, um, it will be nice yeah. to, um, to meet together the following evening. Um, and so that was part of why we started these, but also because the, it really feels that there is this net of, of practitioners, yoga uh, practitioners, Buddhist practitioners, who we connect with um, deeply. Um, and at the moment, are, so many of us are unable to meet in person. And um, so, this idea of the studio talks is a takeoff on what Richard used to do. And many of you know about the old studio talks that we used to have. And they would happen at the yoga workshop when we owned that um, after Sunday night Mysore class. And after that class, um, it would be this hot, smelly, sweaty, kind of stinky, uh, humid room. We'd open the doors to air it out. And Richard would kind of be walking around. He was just waiting for people to leave. And then someone would say, well, will you do a studio talk tonight? Meaning, will you talk about some philosophical something? And uh, he'd say, well, if anyone's here in 15 minutes, I'll give a talk. <laughs> and Same for this. Same for this. So if you're still here in 15 minutes, we'll start. <laughs> and so... Um, and that's really how that started happening. And we've just recently taken those archives of talks that uh, we had, and um, we are starting a little YouTube channel that will have those as podcasts. We'll put a new one up uh, the first Monday, I think, of every, every month and until we run out um, because people did stay and uh, Richard did beautiful, entertaining, and insightful, Mostly entertaining. insightful, insightful yeah. talks. And so we want to talk a little bit tonight, and then um, if there's time and interest, and if we can figure out the technology, we'll do uh, offer some time for questions and answers at the end. So. Mm, okay. So we were going to chant. Uh, the invocation of the Yoga Taravali, which is a text that uh, many of you have read, but it's uh, a beautiful text uh, in the Sri Vidya Tantra tradition of Shankaracharya. And it has a lot of wonderful subtle meaning uh, built into it. And with the 
common uh, Ashtanga Yoga invocation is the opening of that text. And so um, part of your homework is to learn that text. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do the chant and then we'll um, focus on one particular word within it. Hmm. Om Vande Gurunam Charanara Vinde San Vande Gurunam Charanara Vinde Sandashi Tasva Atma Sukhava Bote Sandashi Tasva Atma Sukhava Bote Nishreyase Jangalikaya Mane Nishreyase Jangalikaya Mane Samsara Hala Hala Moha Shantyae Samsara Hala Hala Moha Shantyae Om So the word halaha, uh, which sounds a lot like uh, a particular English word that I can't quite remember what it is. Um, but, and I have a feeling that maybe um, the words are related. Um, halahala is the poison or the difficulty uh, that came up in a very old but very interesting story about yoga practice. And this yoga practice was actually a very powerful, uh, efficient yoga practice. And it was had to be arranged um, because many, many beings at that time, uh, gods and their shadows, uh, demons, uh, were all interested in having a good time. Um, yet they were faced with something called impermanence. Uh, the fact that everything, uh, even the entire universe, uh, is subject to uh, change. And so they decided they wanted to get this uh, magical ingredient called amrita. So mrit means death. Amrita means no death. But it also uh, refers to a product called nectar, uh, which in yoga we uh, learn to mm, taste from the root of the palate. And this lets, connects us very quickly to something of extreme pl uh, pleasure, isn't exactly the right word, satisfaction uh, deep inside of our own hearts. And so, in order to make it, they got instructions on how to make nectar. And each of the gods uh, had to find their corresponding demon. And so this in itself uh, is a whole psychological exploration. Uh, you know, what in my mind uh, do I project out that I don't, that I refuse to believe is me? And that's for many of us, the demon or the psychopath, or the selfish, uh, horrible being that you just wish didn't exist, you know, beings that hurt other beings. And so when the gods managed to find uh, their demons, then it was arranged that they could take this gigantic mountain called Mount Meru, which happened to be correspond to the central axis of the body, and they threw it in the ocean, uh, I'll tell you quickly the story. The, the ocean, the mountain, it was a big ocean. The mountain sank, so they had to find a turtle to hold the mountain up. And then when the mountain was positioned on the turtle, it would spin. And then they had to get a snake, uh, which they wrapped, a gigantic snake called the Naga, um, which were around in those days. Um, and they're still around. Yeah. So we hear. Yeah, we hear about them. And they wrapped the snake three and a half times around the mountain. 
and then they could churn the mountain or they could churn this great causal ocean, uh, hoping to get uh, the nectar of immortality. Um, so the demons uh, were very proud. They are a much more caste conscious group than even the gods. Um, Pretty and many of the gods conscious. who are very caste conscious. <clears throat> it's all caste conscious people. And uh, the, they had to like decide who was going to hold the heads of the snake. Uh, of, there were, it was a multi-headed cobra and the mouths of the cobra occasionally would belch flames. Uh, not particularly comfortable. And, but the tail end of the cobra occasionally would uh, release what we call uh, shesha uh, or residue, Ex yeah. excrement. <laughs> yeah, excrement. Yeah. And so the demons uh, refused to take the tail of the snake. Um, and they, because it was low class, so they were even more class conscious than the gods, if you can imagine. And so the gods actually were pleased with this. And so the demons took the uh, multiple heads of the snake and the gods took the tail and they started to practice yoga, which means to churn back and forth uh, the causal ocean, hoping to make nectar and what happened was that they didn't get nectar at first. Uh, they got what was called hala hala, which is just this stinky, horrible poison um, that started to wash up, you know, all around the universe. On wherever there were beaches in the universe, there was this sludge washing up, and it was smelly. Uh, probably smelled like. You know, things that are unpleasant. And, <laughs> and they didn't know what to do because gods and demons, everyone was interested in this whole thing from around the universe, were like going, ah, this is like the worst smell, do something. And they asked Vishnu, who was sitting on the peak of the mountain, to do something. And he just kind of like spun his discus a little bit, his discus of time. And instead, everyone called on Shiva, uh, Shiva who deals with snakes and uh, who deals with uh, things that are generally rejected by people, such as people who are rejects, such as people that uh, have difficulty, mental problems. Uh, such as Shesha. Yeah. No, yeah, so he deals with that. He deals with them. Uh, people who are perhaps even demonic yeah. or psychopathic yeah. or the kind that you would never uh, feel very close to or forgiving towards. And uh, so Shiva went down to the shore of the ocean and he scooped up the hala hala in his hand and it was like, Ew. and everybody was like standing back and he did something that, um, I'm not sure I'd recommend this to anyone. He went, <laughs> I guess the story is very boring for a while there because the important thing is he did not swallow the hala hala, but he did not spit it out. And so right there is a formula for uh, meditation practice. Yes. Uh, and so he didn't reject it, uh, but he didn't like cling on to it as if there were something, or he yeah, as if it were desirable or repulsive, but he just like put everything on pause. He suspended that activity of mind and he simply looked at it deeply. Uh, and in that space within the story, then things began slowly to transform because, and after some period of time and, and, and it took, you know, thousands of years for the whole story to unfold. But because he had treated this unsavory uh, part of the um, yoga process, yeah, the process, <laughs> um, 
and what, he treated it with respect and with almost like bearing witness to it rather than engaging with it. Um, things around it and the people around it and the situation around the whole churning of the ocean started to uh, shift in a way that, that was more positive. Um, and, and at that point in the story, many, many great things came out of the ocean. Lakshmi appeared out of the ocean. And um, you know, she's this uh, goddess that, that really symbolizes um, wealth, but also uh, sort of bounty and, and good health and good, good things in life. And she disappears when there is this feeling of grasping and clinging and fighting and non-communication. She just sort of fades mm. away. And so it was in that space that she was able to come up out of the ocean as well as many other. Yeah, and an interesting part, she came out of the ocean holding a pot as in Kumba, as in your uh, Ganesh belly. And there was a pot of nectar. <clears throat> but of course, uh, she also represents the things that everyone wants. Mm -hmm. She represents even wealth and power. And so the, there was this one demon who swooped down and stole the pot of nectar and very bad person, by the way. And if they won the election, I mean, if they, <laughs> <laughs> if they drank the nectar, it would be a disaster for the whole universe. And so the demon just turned it like that. And just as one drop of it touched the lips of the demon, Vishnu, who was generally trying not to interfere with uh, this uh, wonderful story, he likes it. And so he took his Kala chakra or his little discus, Sudarshan, and he went zip, zip, and the demon's head was removed uh, right at the top of uh, C1. <laughs> so the head came very neatly off. And so what happened was the demon's head was immortal because it had touched a drop of nectar. But Fortunately, its body fell off. And so as it was biting the moon, which the moon represents the nectar, the moon would pop right out of the other head. And so this is actually the uh, scientific explanation <laughs> of uh, lunar eclipses, in case you were interested. <laughs> but what's interesting, though, is the... The, what Shiv did when he did not swallow, but he did not spit out, but instead he held the hala hala in the space of his throat and simply practiced uh, a very excellent meditation. And so what the this shows us is that um, the relationship between what we call samskara and vritti. And vritti is when things appear in your mind. And a, a vritti could be uh, you know, just anything you experience. It could be sensation. It could be ideas, stories, uh, any kind of thought you're having, uh, any kind of emotional tag that you place onto sensation. All of those are considered vrittis. And they're good vrittis and bad vrittis, they're really miserable vrittis. And many of the, you know, vrittis arise because sort of in the, in the subconscious mind or in the, in the mind that we don't really tap into all the time, there are these seeds of, you know, of everything in the world. And this is also representative of the, shadows as well as the you know great things in life our shadow side as well as our you know mm. other sides and so there's seeds for anger there's seeds for sorrow for pain um and they're there ready uh to 
to blossom and to come into being. Mm -hmm. And depending on the circumstances that arise, and in the case of uh, doing yoga, where we move the body and move the fascia and move um, sort of patterns of stuck patterns of mm -hmm. physical embodiment, sometimes these seeds of different natures come to the surface or we're in a situation in our world where these seeds get watered and then come to and then they throw up yeah i don't know if that's the correct term cast they okay. cast up <laughs> um, a vritti or just something a pattern it could be a whole universe it could be uh, but they that you then observe and if you observe it as shiva observed without attraction i thought oh i like that or without repulsion um then that which the kind of the embodied seed of it the samskara uh is gradually deconstructed because and this happens through the process that is this ongoing process of impermanence this process of change which is you know observed as the gunas acting on the gunas. And so something comes into our awareness as a chitta vritti. And, you know, if we don't react to it, um, it takes the natural course where it's this wave pattern and it's, you know, at the peak of the wave, that's when we really see it. And then it may subside and it may, you know, kind of slowly uh, come out of our awareness. And then it goes back down into the unconscious and where it rests again until something happens to to promote it uh, to promote it again. Yeah. And so when it is down there, if we have grasped hold of it, the idea of it, like the and and an example might be anger. Like if we become angry or jealous or fearful, and that comes into our awareness, and we, you know, fret or we. Uh, about, you know, because we're, we're worrying about something or we act out because we're angry, then that, instead of letting the, the seed sort of become less well taken care of, it's like putting, you know, mung beans in a, in a sprouting jar and, you know, soaking them and then rinsing them for a few days. Watch what happens. And that's what happens to these seeds in the in our subconscious I'm if sorry. we don't practice this yeah. idea of mindfulness yeah. and still even if we're mindful occasionally <laughs> um, the attention will waver so i've heard uh, and, uh, and then and then you're then all of a sudden storylines reappear perhaps but you can have really good storylines uh that uh you know say is storylines with the and you have some intention of you know making a wonderful world for people um but it's still based in a storyline with definitions of people and so you can have some scars that are really good some scars um and then some scars that are really bad some scars some scars that are pretty neutral but all of them even the good some scars um eventually have to be deconstructed because all of the samskaras are held like scars to in as your body they are the, they are the really what the flesh or that they are the history histos of what it, the body is and yeah and, and they're held in, in the embodied sense they're held also in the fascia so that the fascia that connects everything and connect wraps around every muscle and every muscle bundle and connects us head to toe. Um, it is just this remarkable part of our physical makeup that when any thought or emotion or a physical um, sort of trauma happens to the body, the fascia responds just elegantly and reorganizes itself. Um, if you've ever, many of us are vegetarian, but if you have ever seen or weren't a veg 
seen a chicken breast, um, or if you were not a vegetarian at perhaps one point, in the market. perhaps in the market, um, and you know you've seen the skin be pulled back from the chicken breast. This is, and you see this sort of this clear, transparent, transparent clear. substance that looks almost like cling wrap or something. That is fascia, and that's what is everywhere in your own body, not that very same fascia, but that type of connective tissue that is incredibly intelligent. It has a huge amount of um, intelligence because it is filled with nerves. Mm -hmm. And so it just responds, you know, mm -hmm. just remarkably. And it, it connects the body in full body patterns. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these, uh, any kind of samskara that I have, if I, it's a full body pattern. And so it affects, and if I practice yoga, then the sensations or the raw sensations in the body uh, arise and the samskara will trigger, the samskara will then take me off into a storyline. Uh, and there could be endless numbers of crazy storylines good storylines, bad storylines. But the idea of suspending uh, the reaction to the samskaras is just really feeling, uh, feeling what you feel. Uh, not feeling in the sense of emotional feeling, but just the raw experience of the vitalness, the sensation, um, which is what we call prana, uh, or I like the term spanda shakti, or vibrant shakti. Uh, and this is considered uh, to be a divine or amazing thing. And so if you can just feel that, um, it will make the whole body, um, what's the word? Oh, the middle path opens and the body is just like light. Uh, or joy, or, but it's a kind of experience that is described as being without any, it's so satisfying that the ego patterning, which is part of the story, dissolves at least temporarily. Mm -hmm. And in that you start to have this natural, it's not a constructed, a natural touching or with everybody else yeah. in your heart. And that's and and it, it comes in practice. phases also, um, so that mm. you know this idea of if only I could just get that you know th that idea of not holding on to things and you mm. know if you if you, if you have if you try too hard or if you're new at it or if you haven't been practicing for years and years or possibly even lifetimes it's not necessarily true that every time you manage to notice a samskara arise or chitvritti arise, that you know, once you notice it, then you say, oh good, I've noticed it and I breathe into it and then the channel opens. Well, look at me, yeah, the I just channel noticed. Opens. Sometimes it's just <laughs> like this, again, you're, what you're doing is setting seeds in the subconscious body in the subconscious awareness of the fascia of the body, in the subconscious parts of the mind, you're setting seeds of trust and truth and connection that when watered with intelligence and with the process of a mindfulness type of practice in general, those seeds also start to sprout and start to come forth into the the more conscious uh, mm. experience. And so after some time, it is this, it, it's sort of a cumul cumulative effect. So many people, when we begin doing yoga, yoga is sort of uh, the embodied version of the story of the churning of the ocean, where we're churning the, all of these different patterns in the body and we go into yoga thinking I'm going to get into this bliss state and the first thing that comes <laughs> up you may have noticed well for sometimes the first thing that comes up is this 
feeling that Richard was describing of bliss, you know, pure bliss and being able to see, you know, something and feel something you've never felt. But even if that happens the first time, it's quite likely that the second or third time. <laughs> that if you have a good practice, um, what you're doing in practice is you're uh, invoking, you know, in sitting or in asana practice, a particular sensation pattern that normally wouldn't be invoked. Mm -hmm. And then um, the hala hala starts to appear when you actually start to feel what you're actually feeling. Um, oftentimes, we're so eager to uh, say, look good on camera. <laughs> <laughs> that we're taking selfies in the middle of practice. Uh, I've heard about that. You know? <laughs> and so we're not really paying attention to what we're actually feeling, but we're just thinking about, wow, you know, I'm going to sell this selfie. I'll post it. And I'll get billions of sentient beings worshiping me. And just the excitement of that. So in my mind, I'm grasping at some completely way off storyline. And I'm not feeling what I actually feel. But if the, if the practice is well set up in which for, you know, you awaken a sense, a pattern, sensation field. Uh, so you get a particular vritti and then you do the complementary opposite, uh, which was probably um, hidden by the mind. And you go back and forth uh, you start to get both pattern, you know, uh, and its counter pattern arising at the same time, which is very stunning for the mind. And then, aha, you start to go, you you're, you're don't know what to think because you, you've balanced what we call the sun channel and the moon channel. And in that stunning, you get this, very short, usually a short taste, but this starts to br bring you to this point of the experience of hala hala, which is actually necessary. That's considered to be the beginning of the yoga practice in which you are entering the practice um, with this sense of something very deep, very inexpressible, uh, what's the word, sacred, uh, that's maybe extremely satisfying. Um, and so you're then willing uh, to face, uh, another thing, face your demons, <laughs> or face fear, which for even, even for the gods is initially fear of death. Um, uh, recognizing the truth of impermanence and so you are really entering the real practice of the yoga, uh, and you're really starting to learn meditation and both yoga asana and yoga pranayama by hala. Uh, and so, in a sense, without the churning, without the arising of these things that under uh, sort of average normal circumstances we would consider to be unpleasant, um, then the, the depth of the practice and the transformative quality that, that resides within a healthy practice is something that is never presented to us. It's, it, so one can go for years and years and years, as Richard said, sort of blocking right at the solar plexus, emotions that might arise or fears or truths or whatever, um, and not letting this, this sort of demonic or the unpleasant things arise within our awareness. And if we, you know, if we run off into storylines with them, then it's disastrous. But if we avoid them totally, um, one of the things physically that it feels like happens is we are really cut off from the core of the body, from the core of the heart, which is this, the embodied 
place within, within our experience where we connect to others, where we, we do see um, impermanence, but we also feel interconnectedness. And so instead of necessarily fear arising, what starts to arise is um, the ability to see that we're all in this boat together, whether we are human beings, whether we are other sentient beings or, you know, forests or trees or coral out in the ocean, that, we, mm. that this is this huge interconnected uh, sort of experience that we are having if we are courageous enough and, and um, if we practice openly enough to really tap into it. And when we can do that, that's where the seed of kindness and the seed of compassion um, starts to, which is one of those seeds in all of us, even the psychopaths, the demonic ones, um, they have those, those seeds for kindness and compassion as well. They just haven't Deeply. been watered that. They're Deeply. really buried. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of shesha on top of them. And it's, you know, so, so this is, the, and, and we wanted to talk about this tonight in particular because um, in a sense, this period of time that, that we are all experiencing together, the pandemic, um, the um, just, inhumanity to man that is going on, the inhumane ways people are treating each other that have come to light, but that have been going on forever. Um, the ways we are being so, um, as a world, we are not taking care of one another. Um, we're not taking care of the environment, although there is this amazing, and wonderful um, sort of surge of waking up of people saying, wait a minute, I'm not wanting to do that. I want to be part of something, something better. Mm -hmm. And so what, what part of why we wanted to talk about this tonight is that we have been talking to students over the last few weeks and, and experiencing ourselves and feeling and reading in the news that you know, one of the things that's happening to people now since we've been involved in the pandemic and lockdowns and violence in the streets and in the United States, the election being so uh, anxiety provoking that people are becoming really um, frazzled and, and, um, and, and that's a natural response when you're trying to do something with all of this stuff that is arising when you're trying to, rather than holding it with kindness and compassion and acting uh, slowly rather than reacting. So acting with compassion rather than reacting. And what, we're, what we are mm. hoping is true and believe to be true is that the story of the world, our world as we know it, our globe and our universe as we know it, um, in a way is also like the macrocosm version of the churning of the ocean, where things for a long time have been being churned. Um, and they've been, and it has been kind of this boring back and forth and back and forth. And, somehow this year, suddenly this uh, hala hala has come to the surface and the more that has come to the surface, the more we're finding is beneath it. Um, and, and there are indicators as there are in the story of the turning of the ocean that if we keep working it together if we keep steady and stable ourselves and hold on to, um, you know, this capacity to e experience um, equanimity in this sort of situation, that the good 
things, the wonderful things like Lakshmi, like, you know, the, I think it was the moon or something itself was said to come up out of the ocean in one of the myths. One of the stories. I, yeah, one of the stories I read. So it's like everything spectacular also came out, but you, it didn't come out until the awful stuff had been dealt with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it's one has to actually uh, feel what they're feeling. Um, and so Mary mentioned right here, the solar plexus. So we have the heart. And so conceptually, we think, oh, all beings are in my heart. And, and we have a con conceptual idea of that or images of that. But we want to actually feel um, something more visceral in which when you feel it, you, you don't even have conceptions of it. It is so like stunning. And that is the, you're feeling interconnectedness rather than idealizing interconnectedness. Um, and but you start, you know, to idealize it is wonderful, but that's still uh, based on certain images and beliefs that one has but by communication and inquiry, by looking into this, which people are just starting to do, they're becoming interested in other people. <laughs> like, oh, are, are you having uh, these experiences? And when they actually sit down and communicate, uh, they start to go, wow, uh, we're, you know, we're not identical, but we're, you know, you're here and I'm there and it's actually a wonderful thing. And so the, the yoga process is really to feel uh, the interconnectedness, uh, not only in the heart, but of course the esoteric yoga that we're talking about is you actually feel it down in your uh, abdominal viscera, your gut, your uh, umbilical cord. Uh, you actually feel you're completely, and it's not just initially, it's not so much with, you know, that we're connected to human beings on, you know, in, in, of course, you know, that's our, our species currently, um, but you feel connected, you know, very strongly to uh, trees and to birds and to grass and to insects. What else? Uh, <laughs> The earth, itself. the entire yeah. ecosystem, the yeah. entire environment. It's like uh, there's a sense of that the whole body is that thing. And so the entire body vibrates uh, with uh, the, and it's not the theory of interconnectedness, which is a good theory, but it's the actual uh, visceral prana, the vibratory uh, experience of that. And in this way, your theories, which are also important because we communicate through words, um, you know, particularly over the internet, <laughs> um, that we upgrade our theories, you know, uh, that we upgrade our understanding of history. We upgrade our understanding of other cultures. Um, and All of these are upgradable. And so the samskaras, even the best samskaras that pull up the best vrittis, you know, the vrittis that sparkle, um, can be upgraded. And that's the whole process. And, and the counterpart to that process is that we downgrade, you know, some of the defense mechanisms that, that especially living in the 21st century and the 20th mm. century have perpetuated these uh, sort of physical barriers uh, that we have put up around ourselves that, you know, we have this time in history has, if nothing else, has made us all see our vulnerabilities and has made us see that not only are we vulnerable, but everyone else is vulnerable. And if we have fear and terror at the thought that we are vulnerable and therefore we, you know, make clothes off you know, our hearts and we, you know, 
become more and more and more rigid in our thinking and in our and when our samskaras arise we become really stuck to them in this mm. this period of conditioned existence i find i even bite at them I go, <laughs> oh. you know, like a, um and, and so it's this, only reading the news yeah oh boy <laughs> yeah we have to limit reading the news which that's a whole nother we won't bore you with that one but <laughs> But, uh, but that's this, you know, this downgrading that happens automatically when you start upgrading some of the more visceral connections uh, to mm. other beings and to the environment. And so really, as we look at, well, how can we take this time, which we're part of, um, and not freak out, not become complacent, not become uh, so beaten down by it, either, none of those things, mm -hmm. so that we can keep the vibrance alive within us, and then at the opportune moment, have enough uh, fortitude and intelligence to know what to do, to take actions where our uh, negative samskaras that have gotten us along for years and years um, are set aside and we say wait a minute what's happening here now and and so you know that's the optimistic mm -hmm. side of this whole period that we're going through and in a way you know the fact that it is going on and on and on and we don't know when things are ever going to change and that it is really good that they're not going to get back to normal because normal wasn't working. And uh, it, it was in an illusory way working for a few people who um, were trying to keep things as they were. Um, but in fact, mm -hmm. things needed to change. And so, as yoga practitioners and as people who really care about other people, you know, what else is there to do than to try to be steady, try to be stable when we can. Notice when we freak out. I was freaking out about 45 minutes or about 15 minutes ago and I'm like, no, this, we're not online. You know, noticing <laughs> that, I noticed it very, you know, very. Uh, I did apologize as I was saying, but I was, you know, that that's how we, you know, if we can notice it even as it's going on, it's better than not noticing it at all. So to really look at this and help each other, know that there are a lot of us out there who are um, experiencing similar things. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we help? Yeah. And so we're learning and we're, I think we're in the, the beginning stages of learning how to communicate, uh, particularly said just in the world of yoga, uh, it's very unusual, although historically it's whenever there's a big blossoming of yoga historically, that's when traditions have communicated and exchanged notes and, uh, you know, you know, appreciated each other deeply. And then we go into periods where everyone is off, you know, competing uh, with the other and, uh, and misrepresenting the other. And uh, so it's really communication and study. And in those moments of communication, uh, there's enlightenment that can happen. And so the, the beautiful thing now is it's in a sense, it's global. Um, because the, the biosphere is this beautiful planet, mm -hmm. and uh, it's time. Yeah. And so there's much study to do. There's so much to learn, so much um, to exchange. It's quite exciting, actually. And, uh, and, and you know, so our thoughts, our advice mm -hmm. is, you know, stay in touch with people you care about. Stay in touch and communicate with people you 
are curious about and people maybe you disagree with. Um, and if they're mean and violent towards you, don't feel that you need to keep trying to communicate with them. Mm -hmm. But be the person um, who might step over the uh, illusory boundary that has been made between cultures, between individuals, between ideas, and, and test the waters. And if you are practicing well and uh, staying in the breath, staying grounded in your body and in this process of mindfulness, um, then you're, you know, you're stable. And you're, you, yes, you're vulnerable, but you are also in command of your own um, intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so someone's got to take the risks. Yeah, you're vulnerable, but um, you're also not attached uh, to your self-image. Or to And that. so people say, you're completely nuts. And you say, hmm. Yeah, that's true and sometimes. You, yeah, you're willing to like, uh, Keep communicating, yeah. uh, rather than fighting. Yeah, because uh, the fighting doesn't seem to work out. Doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah. And so it's the art of diplomacy uh, is communication, and the art of authenticity yeah, uh, of really truly tapping in yeah. to where you are and and what you can authentically <laughs> offer, yeah. and and forgiving yourself. If you can't offer anything, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, or if you have a demonic outburst mm -hmm. now and then. <laughs> and so it's really like the experience of yoga is the experience of all beings in the heart. And of course, you know, you start with easy beings, you know, like puppies, kittens, um, <laughs> nice people, yoga people. Um, but then you, you know, there are a few that uh, are, are difficult and we tend to throw them out of our heart, um, out of anger, and then they are deposited somewhere else in the body as samskara, you know, like perhaps in your neck or other places. You can uh, investigate that. But then to get even those who are, uh, what's the word? Uh, not nice yeah. <laughs> uh, into your heart it doesn't mean that you agree with them even a tiny bit yeah. but it means you kind of see you see them deeply and you, you uh, see what the ultimately um, the pathetic or yeah, perhaps one day you know and, and so maybe you know this is something that we might even talk about next time is how do you actually do that? Um, <laughs> and you know, and it's not necessarily easy, but um, right. yeah, but yeah. you know, there have been people in your own life, um, and I can speak from my own experience. Uh, there have been people in my life who, when I have not been, you know, in my best form. Um, have been really kind to me, have been really generous with me. And that that has been this, you know, samskaric seed of, you know, kindness within myself that has gotten watered. And then I'm able to sort of let that part of myself come mm -hmm. forth. And so that's, that's kind of how it works. So, we hope this has helped a little bit. It's helped us to see your beautiful faces. And um, let's see, if anyone has any questions, um, let's see, what relationship do you see between the concept of halahala and the kleshas as described in the Yoga Sutras? Furthermore, ah, do you have any comments on the Yoga Sutras verse 2.52 um, in Shankara's commentary mentioning pranayama being the best tapas for purification of the kleshas. Well, we could talk mm. about that next time. That's a huge question to throw in in five minutes, but um, 
relationship between the concept of Havahala and the Kleshas, there is one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alex. And will the next talk be before the US elections? The next talk, our thought is that we will do a talk this week, next week, and then the week after. So yes. And then maybe on a, hopefully on a regular basis, if not every week, maybe every other week or every once a month. Um, so um, what about the energy now with Nav, Nav, Rati. Another Rati. Yeah. The nine months. Yeah. It's a good time to practice. Yes. Good time to practice. Okay. So I think we've gotten questions answered. Um, if any of you have thoughts that of things that you'd like us to address in some of these talks, and we'll keep on doing them um, until we stop doing them, but definitely for a while. Mm -hmm because uh, we love connecting. But if you have questions about things, uh, please feel free to email us through the website or if you have my email, feel free to email me and we'll try to work things in for you, okay? So please be safe, mm -hmm. uh, take care of yourselves. If you're in the United States, please vote. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want to chant to end it? We could do the chant. Yeah. Swasti? Yes. Okay. So let's do the chant to end. So we're asking that all beings that are manifested, prajapya meaning born, that they be swasti. Okay. Oh. Vasti Prajavya Paripalayantam Nayena Margena Mahim Mahesha Bo Brahmane Bhya Shubhastunityam Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mary and Richard. Thank you. Please. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, we're so Thank good you. to see you. So please stay in touch. <laughs> And uh, we'll see you next time, maybe. Okay? Bye. Bye. So good to see bye you. Bye bye. 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 <laughs>